there's a general concern that models get censored by the companies that deploy them. So one case where we've seen that, and maybe censorship is one word, al alignment, maybe via RLHF or some other way is another word. So that we, we saw that with black Nazi image generation with uh, Gemini. Uh, as you mentioned, we also see that uh, with Chinese models refusing to answer what happened <laughs> in uh, June 4th, 1989 at Tiananmen Square. So how can this be avoided? And maybe can you just in general talk about how this happens and how can it be avoided? You give multiple examples. Um, there's probably a few things to keep in mind here. One is the kind of Tiananmen Square factual knowledge, like did thing, like how does that get embedded into the models? Two is the Gemini, what you call the Black Nazi incident, which is when Gemini as a system had this extra thing put into it that dramatically changed the behavior. And then three is what most people would call general alignment, RLHF post-training. Um, each of these have very different scopes in how they are applied. In order to do, if you're just look at the model weights, in order to audit specific facts is extremely hard because you have to chrome through the pre-training data and look at all of this, and then that's terabytes of files and look for very specific words or hints of the words. So I guess one way to say it is that you can insert censorship or alignment at various stages in the pipeline. And what you refer to now is at the very beginning of the data selection. Yeah. So stage. if you want to get rid of facts in a model, you have to do it at every stage. You have to do it at the pre-training. So most people think that pre-training is where most of the knowledge is put into the model, and then you can elicit and move that in different ways, whether through post-training or whether through systems afterwards. Th this is where the whole like hacking models comes from, right? Like GPT will not tell you how to make anthrax, but if you try really, really hard, you can eventually get it to tell you about anthrax because they didn't filter it from the pre-training data set, right? But by the way, removing facts has such a ominous, dark feel I to it. Almost think it's practically impossible because you effectively have to remove them from the internet. You're you're taking on a what this, did, did did they remove the the mm thing from the subreddits? The mmmmm. It gets filtered out, right? So, so you that's... have quality filters, which are small language models that look at a document and tell you like, how good is this text? Is it close to a Wikipedia article, which yeah. is a good thing that we want language models to be able to imitate. So, so couldn't you do a small language model that filters out mentions of Tiananmen Square in the data? Yes, but is it going to catch um, wordplay or that, encoded language? I mean, people have been meaning thing. on like games and other stuff, how to like say things that don't say Tiananmen Square. Mm -hmm. um, but the, Or like, yeah, so there's always like different ways to do it. There's, hey, the internet as a whole does tend to just have a slight left bias, mm -hmm. right? Because it's always been richer, more affluent, uh, younger people on the internet relative to the rest of the population. So there is already inherently a slight left bias, right, on the internet. And so how do you filter things that are this complicated, right? Is it like, and, and some of these can be like, you know, factual, non-factual, but like Tiananmen Square is obviously the example of a factual, but it gets a lot harder when you're talking about aligning to a ideal, right? Um, which and, is... Yeah. Yeah. And so Grok, for example, right, Elon's tried really hard to make the model not be super PC and woke, but the best way to do pre-training is to throw the whole freaking internet at it, right? And then later figure out, but then at the end of the day, the model at its core now still has some of these ideals, right? You still ingested Reddit slash r slash politics, which is probably the largest political discussion board on the world that's freely available to scrape. And guess what? That's left-leaning, right? Um, and so, um, you know, there are some aspects like that, that you just can't censor unless you try really, 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 really hard. So the base model uh, will always have some TDS, trauma derangement syndrome, because it's trained so much. It'll have the ability to you, express it. But what if, what if you... <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a wide representation in the data. So this is what happens. It's like put a lot of modern, what is called post-training. It's a series of techniques to get the model on rails of a really specific behavior. Uh, and and I mean, it's it's like you can, you also have the ingested data of like Twitter or like Reddit slash r slash the Donald, which is like also super pro-Trump, right? And then you have like fascist subreddits or like you have communist subreddits. So you, the model in pre-training ingests everything. It has no worldview. Now it does have like some, some skew because more of the text is skewed a certain way, uh, which is general, like slight left, like, but also like 
you know, somewhat like, you know, intellectual, somewhat like, you know, it's just like the general internet is a certain way. Mm -hmm. And then, and then as, as, as Nathan's about to describe eloquently, right? Like you can, (laughs) you can elicit certain things out. And uh, there's a lot of history here. So we can go through multiple examples and what happened. Llama 2 was a launch that the phrase like too much RLHF or like too much safety was a lot. It's just, that was the whole narrative after Llama 2's chat models released. And the examples are sorts of things like you would ask Llama 2 chat, how do you kill a Python process? And it would say, I can't talk about killing because that's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. And anyone that is trying to design an AI model will probably agree that that's just like, eh, model, you messed up a bit on the training there. I don't think they meant to do this, but this was in the model weight. So this is not, like you, it didn't necessarily be, a, there's things called system prompts, which are when you're querying a model, it's a piece of text that is shown to the model, but not to the user. So a fun example is your system prompt could be talk like a pirate. So no matter what the user says to the model, it'll respond like a pirate. In practice, what they are is you are a helpful assistant. You should break down problems. If you don't know about something, don't tell them your date cutoff is this. Today's date is this. It's a lot of really useful context for how can you answer a question well. And Anthropic publishes their system yes, prompt. Yes, which I think is great. And there's a lot of research that goes into this. And one of your previous guests, Amanda Askell, is like, probably the most knowledgeable person that at least in the combination of execution and sharing she's the person that should talk about system prompts and character of models yeah and then people should read these system prompts because you're you're like trying to nudge sometimes through extreme politeness the model to be a certain way and you could use this for bad things I mean, we've done tests which is what if i tell the model to be a dumb model like which evaluation scores go down and it's like will have this behavior where it could sometimes like say, oh, I'm supposed to be dumb. And sometimes it's like, it doesn't affect like math abilities as much, but something like a, if you're trying, it's just the quality of a human judgment would draw to the floor. Let's go back to post-training, specifically RLHF around Llama 2 was, it was too much RL, too much safety prioritization was baked into the model weights. This makes you refuse things in a really annoying way for users. It's not great. It caused a lot of um, like awareness to be attached to RLHF that it makes the models dumb. And it, it stigmatized the word. It, it did in AI culture. And as the techniques have evolved, that's no longer the case where all of these labs have very fine-grained control over what they get out of the models through techniques like RLHF. Although although different labs are definitely different levels. Like on the on one end of the spectrum is Google. Um, and then like maybe OpenAI does less and Anthropic does less. Um, and then like on the other end of the spectrum is like XAI, yeah. but they all have different forms of RLHF trying to make them a certain way. And the, like the important thing to say is that no matter how you want the model to behave, these RLHF and preference tuning techniques also improve performance. So on things like math evals and code evals, there is something innate to these, what is called contrastive loss functions. We could start to get into RL here. We don't really need to, but RLHF also boosts performance on anything from a chat task to a math problem to a code problem. So it is becoming a much more useful tool to these labs. So this kind of takes us through the arc of, we've talked about pre-training, hard to get rid of things. We've talked about post-training and how post-training, if you you, you can mess it up. It's, it's a complex, multifaceted optimization with 10 to 100 person teams converging on one artifact. It's really easy to not do it perfectly. And then there's the third case, which is what we talked about, Gemini. The thing that was about Gemini is this was a served product where Gemini, Google has their internal model weights. They've done all these processes that we talked about. And in the served product, what came out after this was that they had a prompt that they were rewriting user queries to boost diversity or something. And this just made it, the outputs were just blatantly wrong. It was a some sort of organizational failure that had this prompt in that position. And I think... Google executives probably have owned this. I didn't pay that attention, that detail, but it was just a mess up in execution that led to this ridiculous thing. But at the system level, the model weights might have been fine. So at the very end of the pipeline, there was a rewriting. To a, something like a system prompt. It was like the system prompt or what is called in industry is like you rewrite prompts. So especially for image models, if you're us- using Dolly or ChatGPT, you can generate you an image you'll say, draw me a beautiful car. Mm -hmm. With these leading image models, they benefit from highly descriptive prompts. So what would happen is if you do that on ChatGPT, a language model behind the scenes will rewrite the prompt, say, make this more descriptive, and then that is passed to the image model. So prompt rewriting is something that is used at multiple levels of industry, and it's used effectively for image models, and the Gemini example is just a failed execution. 
big philosophical question here with RLHF to, to generalize. Where is human input, human in the loop, human data most useful at the current stage? For the past few years, the highest cost human data has been in these preferences, which is comparing, I would say, highest cost and highest total usage. So a lot of money has gone to these pairwise comparisons where you have two model outputs and a human is comparing between the two of them. In earlier years, there was a lot of this instruction tuning data. So mm -hmm. creating highly specific examples to something like a Reddit question to a domain that you care about. Language models used to struggle on math and code. So you would pay experts in math and code to come up with questions and write detailed answers that were used to train the models. Now it is the case that there are many model options that are way better than humans at writing detailed and eloquent answers for things like model and code. So they talked about this with the Llama 3 release where they switched to using Llama 3, 4, or 5B to write their answers for math and code. But they, in their paper, talk about how they use extensive human preference data, which is something that they haven't gotten AIs to replace. There are other techniques in industry like constitutional AI where you use human data for preferences and AI for preferences. And I expect the AI part to scale faster than the human part. But among the research that we have access to is that it humans are in this kind of preference loop. So for uh, as reasoning becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, as we said, where's the role of humans in that? It's even less prevalent. So it's the remarkable thing about these reasoning results, and especially the DeepSeq R1 paper, is this result that they call DeepSeq R10, which is they took one of these pre-trained models, they took DeepSeq V3 base, and then they do this reinforcement learning optimization on verifiable questions or verifiable rewards for a lot of questions and a lot of training. And these reasoning behaviors emerge naturally. So these things like, wait, let me see, wait, let me check this. Oh, that might be a mistake. And they emerge from only having questions and answers. And when you're using the model, the part that you look at is the completion. So in this case, all of that just emerges from this large scale RL training. And that model, which the weights are available, has no human preferences added into the post-training. There are the DeepSeq R1 full model has some of this human preference tuning, this RLHF after the reasoning stage. But the very remarkable thing is that you can get these reasoning behaviors and it's very unlikely that there's humans writing out reasoning chains. It's very unlikely that they somehow hacked OpenAI and they got access to OpenAI O1's reasoning chains. It's something about the pre-trained language models and this RL training where you reward the model for getting the question right. And therefore, it's trying multiple solutions, and it, it emerges this chain of thought. 